This is the chapter that is the engine for the whole story. Let's talk about why this chapter is pivotal for making this story work. Vroom, vroom. Welcome to the Codex Cantina. I am Una. And I am washing my hands. Ah, see what I did there? <laughs> I can do one too. Make sure you wash our before you start Absalom video. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Today, in terms of scope, we are going to be going through a quick plot recap. Uh, hitting some of the major milestones. Again, we're hitting kind of the end of the information, so we don't need to hit that too hard. We're going to go into our analysis, which is going to involve a very quick Charles's past, and then Suppin as a tragedy, why that is the engine that makes this book work. I'm excited for that, because I think we're going to bring home some new points and bring out some fresh light to how this story is not only his masterpiece, but could be a Greek masterpiece. Aristotle mm. would be proud. All right, plot. 1808, Thomas Suppen is born in 2B, West Virginia. 1817, the Suppens move to Tidewater. Suppen sees his sister almost run over, sees her working too hard, and ultimately is stopped by a slave from entering a home from the front. In 1820, at the age of 14, Suppen runs away from home. And in 1823, he moves to the West Indies. 1827, Suppen marries his first wife. Somewhere around when they're building the Sutpen, 100, 1833, 1835, that era, the French architect runs away, and General Compson and Sutpen track him down, and General Compson has told Sutpen's backstory. 1866, Sutpen asks Rosa to have a boy to fulfill his design. 1867, Sutpen courts Millie, age 15, who is Wash's granddaughter. Wash is denied entry into the Suttpen 100, and in 1869, Millie has a daughter, and Wash kills them both, and kills Suttpen, and kills himself. So that's that's the plot recap for Chapter 7. Super important. Lots of spoilers. So this is going to be a real quick analysis on the past, because we need to discuss this, because this is the first time that it's kind of revealed. But first, the question is, what is Sut Penn's design. So Sut Penn's design is to be his own master, his own boss. He wants to lord over others. He doesn't want to work. He wants to be lazy. And he's seen the success and fruition of, uh, of others. And he wants that. Now, Charles Bond goes to an all-white school. Old Miss did not allow people of black lineage into the school at this point in time. And that's important to note. His mom divorced because she didn't fit Sut Penn's design. What made someone unfit to rule over others at this point in time in America, Southern American history? So we talked about Sutpen being the god of the story with Charles Bond being the Christ, the son of God, if you will. And you'll notice in this section, there's usage of father and he where it's capitalized, where it normally wouldn't be capitalized unless it were religious referring to God and Christ, right? Right. And you'll notice at this point in time, they talk about the plantation's daughter, his, his first wife, is her christian name but they'll notice they'll say that her christian name is lowercase c not recognizing religion because Sutpen is the god of this this myth the story very subtle so at this point in time what's the significance of saying someone's christian name as opposed to just their name who had multiple names at this point in time yeah so he has black she has black lineage uh, one something 16th or whatever, 120th. Uh, I don't think it's ever discussed, but that means Charles also has, uh, uh, he, he's mixed blood. So it's interesting too, the way that they brought this about, where they talk about her being of Spanish descent. Don't forget that the way that he paid for some of the Suppens 100 and the chandeliers and stuff was, was Spanish gold coin. So it, it's tying it all together and it's done very beautifully and very subtly. If you really like this also, there's a very subtle theme here of who do you choose to be in life? Charles Bond could be black. Charles Bond could be white. Same with his mother's choice in life of did she want to be black or did she want to be white? That decision of uh, who am I and my racial identity, I feel like is explored more thoroughly. I won't say better, but more thoroughly in, in a whole novel in uh, Light in August, which we will be getting to eventually, which is also by Faulkner. You could also say that it was chosen for them, especially in the case of Charles Bond, by his father, estranged father. Well, you'll notice that his father, knowing that his wife is most likely, like it's never 100% confirmed, but most likely is part black, you'll notice he gives his son a different name. To make sure that he does not carry on that design. He calls him Charles Bond, Charles the Good, specifically to break that relationship and set off a different identity yeah. for him. Yeah. He's disowning him, distancing himself because he's not part of the design. And that brings us back to our last point. I want to get to our next point. But we, Like we said, we have to cover this. 
Last week, we talked about Charles Bond as a Christ-like figure. Jesus did not commit sins per se. Right. But he died for the sins of mankind, which is something that I think resonates or is very emotional for a lot of religious people. Charles Bond didn't choose to be, he was just born this way. He was given, I'm going to say sin, he's given the sin in, in the South's eyes from his his parents that he did not earn himself and dies for that sin, in a sense, in the same way of, of Jesus and and, and uh, God in, in the Christian Bibles. Yeah, and you think about it too, Jesus is only, if he, I mean, he doesn't have any flaws because he is God, but he does question God at the end there, right? And real quick, the only thing uh, that you could say is that he got that is from his mother. Where did Charles Bond get his, quote, sin from, from his mother? From the mom, from the mom's side. Yeah. Yeah, so it aligns all very uh, very well. I like it. I like the analysis of that point. You, you can see why this is one of the greatest story. like how many points we've brought up at this point in time. Let's go into Sutpin as a tragedy. Yeah, so I'm excited. So this is this chapter is a character. This book is a character piece, but holy cow, is this chapter 100% <laughs> character oh, driven. Yeah. And we finally get to see what their view of Suppen's past is. And I think that although we don't know if it is all true or not, it's the only information we have, so it's what we have to go off of. And this is arguably the most important chapter of the book. The next chapter is quite important too as well. I think you will like the next chapter as well. But in this chapter, you'll notice in the very beginning, Shreve says, this is like a theater. And you'll <laughs> notice now we got to start talking about tragedy finally we, we've kind of put it off for a while now is the time to kind of bring it in where if sup pin were just a dude in a story that gets scythed just cut in half it's like okay that sucks i don't care yeah tragedy does not come from just suffering right like if, if someone just suffers that sucks but i don't know if that makes it a tragedy per se no you have to feel for them and then when they suffer you're emotionally attached and drawn in there's so many more nuances too right because because in a comedy the bad guy suffers, but the good guy wins, right? It's the idea that 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 pun that evil is punished in a comedy, right? And there's suffering there. But in a tragedy, everybody suffers, right? Like nobody there just are gets no off. winners. <laughs> <laughs> nobody gets off scot free, right? But we yeah. still feel this emotional resonance with characters, and there's like a cathartic release at the end when when there's resolution. Some would say that tragedy comes from structure. And uh, you know Aaron Sorkin, right? Yeah, so famous author, Few Good Men, West Wing, Social Network. Now, he has said one of the most important things to study is Aristotle's poetics, which you made fun of me in that tag video that we did where I said, named an author that started with A, I said Aristotle. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Finally coming to use, poetics. I've been there. I've been through it. Let's talk about how the structure of Greek tragedies is how Faulkner was able to pull off this story. Yeah, I think that it's very evident. Uh, and if you can just forgive my horrible enunciation of these, we can definitely bring out that all of these are present in this story. So we got to talk about four things. Mimesis, Harmatia, Anagnorisis, Peripatia. I've been practicing them. I honestly have been. All right, so Mimesis. The idea that there is um, imitation in how an artist interprets the real world in art. Simplified, it's characters behaving as characters ought to, if you will. One of the best examples, uh, before we get into it, just so people have a mindset, is we can bring back our old friend, Charles Dickens, and A Christmas Carol. Scrooge is a great example of mimesis. He is a character that is behaving how he's supposed to. If that doesn't suit you, something a little bit more modern, real quick, is the idea of Lord of the Rings and how Peter Jackson used um, the landscape of how it was supposed to be in his story from real landscape in real life. So that was a good way of using mimesis visually. So William Faulkner's version, his original sin of the South is slavery. It's almost like any literary point that you make in this book must be tied back to slavery for it to almost be complete. And he's trying to explore in this piece that slavery wasn't the end. You didn't say, you didn't say, I want to have slaves. 
you wanted to have power. You wanted to lord over others and not have other people tell you what to do. If you wanted to sit back and watch the other people, the cattle, overwork themselves to quote this novel. Yeah, this goes back to any of kingdoms, power, rulers, emperors, shoguns, lording over the lesser thans in their eyes. So Suppin starts out as as any other character as not having a design. He doesn't see the need to rule over others. All he knows is his alcoholic family, his dad, who works and by the sweat of his brow is able to provide for his family. It's only when they move that he starts to see this class divide. When he's moving across town and he sees towns become hamlets and hamlets become villages and villages become, there's that quote where he starts to finally see that there is a class and a racial divide in the country that he didn't even know existed. This was put into him as a reality that he didn't even know was possible. Yeah, so he he grows up, like many of us, innocent and ignorant of a lot of what the world is really like and as you grow older and gain more experiences and as you move you see those things and he's seeing those things for the first time and it really does leave an imprint on him of how he wants to have his own and what his personal destiny will be or his own quote design as we've said several times now i quote never imagine a place a land divided neatly up and actually owned by men who did nothing but ride over it on fine horses or sit in fine clothes on the galleries of big houses while other people worked for them. Really sums up a lot of what a young Suppen, a young Southerner, may be going through. They grow up innocent and start to see this other world where there are class and racial divides in what you provide to society. Yeah, so at this point in the story, as they're moving around and the, his sister is almost uh, run over by a coach, and she's not yielding, and we have this clash, and he realizes the coachman is a black man, and he's like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be better than, and I'm lesser than, and he he doesn't like that. He wants to be able to lord over people um and then he sees his family working so hard um he's denied entry you know into the house these things are what he doesn't understand but he's coming to realize that he doesn't like them he doesn't want them and that he can have an opportunity to fix this he just needs to fix this we well, bring up the, the the next point which is anagnorisis and that's the coming of age losing innocence it's a light bulb moment there's no going back now once we've kind of had this realization from the character whether you like it or not Sutpin is the main character of this story i think there's kind of questions is, is he the protagonist is the antagonist he's an amoral character and he gets that in this section, which is why this is the engine for this book. But this is the anagnorisis section, where when he's told to go around back of the house, before he's even able to tell the, the slave while he's there, that's when he realizes he is lacking power. He is lacking authority. He is lacking what he wants in life, which is the ability for being able to lord over others, like you said earlier, right? Status. Yeah, he lacks status. And he doesn't exactly know why either. Well, and, and, and Faulkner does a good job, really good job, where he even explores like, the well, should I kill them? And if he just took that route, that's a, that's a moralistic route. And he rejects that moralistic route. He goes down the amoral route of just wanting to achieve status without regard to the moralistic abuse that he can apply to other races and classes like he sees as he journeys as a young child. Yeah, it's done very, very uh, subtle, as I've said a couple of times throughout the story. It's just it's kind of woven in there because he could have been a lot more blatant with it, a lot more crass with it. And to bring it in, too, Wash Jones is actually very important for this chapter, too, as you probably noticed when you were reading. He has an anagnorisis moment, too, where his issue is that he realizes the cruelness of Suppin's design. Growing up, Wash Jones was just very accepting of Suppen and goes along with a lot of the abuse and the rules and regulations that Suppen puts onto him. It's almost like kind of like this circular design between Suppen and Wash Jones. Yeah, uh, real quick about that. I, I love how Faulkner in this chapter in particular, he, he jumps back and forth between 
the the Greek tragedy, but also still interweaving our ideas of this struggle between the North and the South in his story. And I think these two characters kind of embody that. And I know I've talked about that a little before, but I think my my if my definition is changing and evolving over the course of the story because I really think Wash could also represent those people in the North that they understand slavery is almost an uh, evil necessity. And they're like, well, we don't like it and we don't do it, but maybe it's okay for, for them. And I think Wash kind of represents that too until he finally sees that he, it is, is not acceptable and that in his mind, Sut Pen is, quote, evil. And we see that view of Sut Pen from Wash Jones, you know, and then he goes on his murder spree. So agonorisis for a modern thought of this, and I thought this one was pretty uh, clever on my part, so you should award me points for it, um, is The Truman Show with Jim Carrey. Mm. Yes. Okay. So when he has the aha moment and the realization and he loses his innocence that he's in a TV show and he thought it was all real life and everything was hunky-dory perfect, and it almost literally hits him on the head when the lights fall from the ceiling of the dome. <laughs> okay, I give you full no. credit for that. I give you 10 points for that one. <laughs> yes! Wait a minute. Is 10 an A? Is that good? <laughs> this is the downfall of the protagonist. This is where we have like a miscalculation. You heard me talk earlier about Jafar and um, Thanos, about how they've kind of calculated and, and their hubris led them to, to their downfall. It's like yeah, that, yeah. except for the main character, the protagonist, typically, of the story is what Hamartia is. So for Sutpin, with his design, I quote, There existed all objects to be wanted, which there were. Or that the ones who owned the objects not only could look down on the ones that didn't. And I'm going to cut the quote off there because sometimes these quotes go on for like a half a page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's his abject usage of of racial class divides and and racism of subjugating an entire race of, of human beings that he didn't do it to hurt them but he did it so that he may exalt himself that he may amoralistically not immoralistically but amoralistically approach life to achieve his desires at the expense of others is his miscalculation that we're kind of seeing in this part in the story. I also think a little bit of his miscalculation is his Aaron judgment on Wash himself. He thought that he could treat Wash however he wanted because he is, quote, better than him because he has more property, money, owns slaves. And in his misjudgment, Wash is the one that kills, you know, Millie, his daughter, and and himself, uh, and Sutpen. So I, I think that's it is too. And like a really good modern one, and you're going to love this, I think that people could kind of wrap their heads around like, oh, I get it, is from none other than Frozen. Elsa is a great example of Harmartia where she misjudges herself and she can't accept herself mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. in doing so she isolates and ostracizes herself from her family and she had just accepted herself her sister accepted her everything would have been fine and the same thing here if Sutpen had just accepted his daughter and accepted wash regardless of their their uh, economic status everything would have been fine. He wouldn't have been killed. He would have gone on and he probably would have continued on, you know, how many years having a, a decent life. You're doing really good. <laughs> now, with that said, you said something there that I want to kind of di dig into. Okay. Because you talked about abuse of Wash Jones. And I think what's interesting here is how Sutpin is circularly treating Wash Jones the exact same way denying him access to the front entrance of Sutpen's Hundred the same way that he was treated as a child. It's, it's that circular activity of he's been there and he's putting other people in that position. Um, speaks a lot to, I feel like, slavery, where slavery was done in a way where people knew what they were doing to them. Sutpen knew what he was doing to Wash Jones in his mistreatment. Sutpen knew that he was mistreating slaves in the same way a lot of white Southerners knew what they were doing to the black slaves 
when they mistreated them. They did it to achieve their design of status elevation at the expense of turning in your moralistic compass, if you will. And that's where I have a hard time agreeing with the idea that he is amoralistic, because how do you defend his innocence when he he knowingly is doing wrong and he's okay with it? And just because he is emulating others that have done it before— he knows it's wrong because he's experiencing it himself doesn't make it okay and doesn't make it a righteous defense in my mind. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of times in this story we see Sutpen as the evil of the story because, again, these might not be true. And we have that, that's the only argument here, I believe, is that we have information that is incomplete and we have second and third and fourth hand accounts because this is not directly what Sut Penn has said. Well, you, you bring a, a good question. And I'm going to say two things. One is William Faulkner himself said that was the design of Sut Penn was to be amoral versus immoral. And two, the way that he's achieving that, arguably, like it sounds like you may challenge that, but Sutpin isn't doing it too um, specifically at the end of of violating morals. He's achieving his design by ignoring morals, not saying that it's morally correct, but by ignoring it, not at the end of of morals is, is kind of how I think Faulkner was intended. Okay, I, I will agree with that. I mean, because that's a pretty good play on semantics there. But he can't he can't J.K. Rowling this. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime well, authors try to say something about their book outside of their book about it to clarify or justify, you, I I'm like, no, you can't do that. You wrote it this way. If you yeah, want to retcon no, it and rewrite no. it, that's fine. But he's dead, so <laughs> you are. Well, you, you have a very fair point too, where depending on who Faulkner was being interviewed by, he would sure. almost take the the antagonistic view, where sometimes he was more. Oh, he a, sounds a, like a total dick, right? <laughs> his goal was to be a dick, basically. Yes. Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> All right, so now in terms of uh, Wash's Hamartia. So Wash's Hamartia is his misjudgment of Sut Pen because he's semi-accepted in here. He's allowed into the big house. He is allowed to uh, party, and he's allowed to do things. Now, he's not actually allowed to stay in the 100, which should have given him some inkling, and that's where he is obviously misjudging. And then he gives his granddaughter to you know this old man to try to have a boy child to carry on his heritage and stuff. And but there's so many red flags thrown at you of like you're yelling at wash like I'm looking at the book reading it going wash wash come on no man open your eyes you've got to see this and he doesn't and that is his hamartia is his infatuation with Sut Pen that maybe he can aspire to this one day and I kind of think of this as um, the lackeys that oh, I don't remember what they're called to, that serve vampires. Because they have the belief that one day the vampires will turn them into vampires. And this all leads to the idea. This, perfect. Hamartia, the point of this, and why this is such this is such an important chapter in what it reveals, is that Hamartia is kind of like a moral of the story. Kids, don't do this because your life will suck when this happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? His blindness to Sutpin's issue. It, look at the things that happened to his granddaughter and the things that he said about it too bad you're not a mayor or I'd give you a place in the stable. Look at Sutpin's hamartia in the sense that he abused an entire race of individuals to build all this thing. He um, abused Mr. Coldfield, he abused General Compson, all at the expense... His own children, his everybody. His own children, at the expense of elevating himself. Kids, don't give up morals for the sole purpose of achieving your desires, because you can end up like Sutpin. That's what Hamartia is, is it gives pity to the audience and a sense of, of satisfaction when there's resolution, which brings us to our final point, which is the peripatia. Peripatia! Which isn't always required, but that is the sudden reversal of fortune, which is super common. And in, in, there's more <laughs> tragedies written with a peripatia than not. And the sudden reversal of fortune, of course, is Wash taking the scythe to Sutpin and kind of murdering him finally. Um, which is important because catharsis is an important idea when it comes to 
to um, Greek tragedies or tragedies in general. It's the idea that we have a pity or fear association with the characters, right? And when the murder happens, there's this purging, like a relief finally of, of finally Suppin is able to stop abusing these people. Finally, Wash has stopped his, his issue, uh, his anagnorisis of, of, believing that uh, uh Sutpin was you know great and that he would just go along with things that that we're purging out the wrongs the catharsis is what gives tragedies value it's what makes you emotionally click with them like they're horrible characters they're doing horrible things why do i like it it's this purging of the bad the that finally makes a tragedy work in, in the viewer or the reader's mind. I got two examples of this. Um, one I think you're going to love, one you're going to hate. <laughs> okay. So the the one that I think is a really good example of this, and he's a, he was a master out of it in his early works, is M. Night Shyamalan with The Sixth Sense. Right? I think that that is an incredible reversal of fortune or the twist in the plot when you realize that he's dead and the kid is seeing a ghost therapist. It's kind of cool. Um, the one that you're going to hate, <laughs> I don't even know what I should tell you. I'm not going to tell you. You got to tell me because I kind of hate that first one. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is Memento. I thought you would hate that one. Oh, I, barely, I don't really remember. I remember it going backwards in time, but I can't remember. What's the peripatia for that one? Where he realizes that he has killed the wrong person and oh, okay. he is the person that killed his wife. Okay, I barely remember that story, so I oh. I can't really comment on those recommendations for Parapodia, but... <laughs> All right, okay. so this was a really important chapter. This was a really important discussion that I hope, whether you're just a reader or whether you're a writer yourself, hopefully this discussion and the idea of Aaron Sorkin looking at uh, you know poetics by, by Aristotle, the idea of what makes a tragedy work and the fact that you hate these characters, but what is it that's drawing you to them? This Hubbardia and the miscalculation. I hope this was able to bring some a different view as to why you may have an emotional connection with this character that you don't like. Why why do you like tragedies? It's the, the idea of the peripatia and purging and the catharsis of those emotions and into the right of what you view as the moralistic view of the story. Um, I'm hoping that this was helpful for you guys. Yeah, being that this is the most arguably important chapter of the entire book, uh, there is a lot more to digest here to talk about, I think, but I th- this will give you a good start to helping get this uh, chapter through uh, because it does give you a lot of information about Sutpen and gives you a lot of background that you needed to know why you should maybe hate or despise this character. But almost unwrongfully so, just like the people in the story. So much to talk about here with the racial divide, with the class diversification between the South. Um, Still a lot more to come. We are finishing up this book with chapters 8 and 9 next week. And I I don't know about how you feel, Crypto, but I'm so excited to do this because because I feel like this has been one of our more fruitful discussions. And uh, I'm just very excited to, to kind of wrap this book up because of how valuable i feel like it's been in 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 our repertoire of literary knowledge i'm excited to get one step closer to my certificate because ah. i know that this is going to have a lot of questions on the test about absalom, <laughs> absalom. <laughs> this is without a doubt his most his most revered work this is without a doubt his most important work it may not be your favorite work you may struggle through this. I'm hoping these discussions can bring you closer to truth or closer to realizations of why so many people have resonated with this work. So please, guys, if you would like to follow us on our literature discussions, please consider subscribing. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for what we're reading and what we're coming up with each week. Uh, and next, I am Una. Thank you for checking us out. Peace.